Now today, uh, our meter, uh, speaker is Nico Mitten, and he's talking on uh, global warming, a simple case for hope. Yeah. That, uh, Climate you. change, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I finally can give this talk. Uh, it, it has been uh, long in the making. For some reason, there were always room problems when I wanted to give it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, the, the, um, the topic is, uh, is not uh, going away, so it, it doesn't really matter that a few months have, have passed since I first wanted to give it. Um, uh, and it is, I think, a, a very important topic. Uh, I go to a lot of um, political meetings, and no matter what what the topic is uh, that is discussed on, on any meeting, I, I guarantee you someone will bring up the problem of, of global warming and, and uh, how we can, can fix it, because it, it plays quite an important role in, in many people's agenda, um, political agenda. So I, I think it's very important that it is uh, addressed, and uh, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do uh, tonight. Uh, and um, the debate, I think, focuses around uh, three major assumptions, which were first put forward by the IPCC in the early 1990s, uh, which are uh, first um, that uh, global warming is real, so it's a real thing that, that uh, humans are warming the, the planet. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is that, uh, that this warming is a problem. And the third assumption is that because it is real and it is a problem, we need to prevent it from, from, from happening. So those are uh, three assumptions. And I think it's very important to understand that these, are, these three assumptions are really um, three independent assumptions from each other. They, they, they stand on their own. Because even if global warming isn't real, so if, if the climate stays, uh, stays the same, that might be a problem. And simultaneously, if global warming is happening, that might not be a problem. So whether it's a problem or not, it's completely independent of whether, it, whether we, we do get a warming or not. And how you deal with whatever is the problem, uh, whether it is a, a stable climate or a, or a changing climate, is... Uh, is is not, I think, a given that the only way to deal with it is to prevent it from happening. There, there might be uh, other alternatives. So uh, I'm going to go through these kind of th three theses and and show what I think is exactly wrong with them. <coughs> uh, so that is the the structure of my talk. Um, so let's start with the first assumption. The, the first assumption is global warming is real. It's a real thing. So this deals with the science of it. And here I've been a skeptic for, for longer than I'm even a, a libertarian. Uh, I, I think I first um, started thinking about this seriously about 20 years ago in the, in the late 90s. And from the very beginning, I, I thought that there are problems with science, that uh, some, some things just uh, don't make much sense. And if you, if you look into the debate, uh, um, you find that the, cl the science is actually not much discussed at all uh, in, in my uh, experience. Uh, what people usually know is, 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 ver is a very sketchy um, kind of summary of what, uh, what uh, they perceive to be the problem. Uh, and uh, what they, the main argument always seems to be in this whole debate is that there is a consensus among scientists that global warming is happening and, and, it's, uh, and it is a problem and therefore we need to prevent it. So all these three, three theses uh, together. And all most people know is scientists agree. So if scientists agree, who am I to question that? Um, now, the first thing to note about this agreement is that it's not clear how big this agreement really is among scientists. Uh, from all I know is there is indeed a majority of scientists who, who agree with that uh, thesis, with these three theses, uh, but um, it's not clear how, how big it is. Uh, a number that is often um, put out is that 97% of scientists agree with this. And these kind of studies are quite uh, dubious um, in, in, in various ways. Some of them simply uh, pre-select scientists by, uh, by their stand on climate change, and then they find that they uh, agree, <laughs> which uh, you would expect if you pre-select them in, uh, in advance. So that's, that's not, not, not very convincing. Um, but 
often they just ask scientists whether they agree on very trivial things, and I'm, I'm going to get into that in, in a moment. They don't really ask scientists about the, the full big picture uh, of, of the whole thesis that it is going to be a disaster. They, they agree on much more technical stuff in, in, in the science. Um, on the on the critical side of though, uh, although no matter how many people agree, how, what percentage agree, there are of course lots of scientists who, who disagree with the with the whole uh, uh, assumption. There is uh, the uh, famous Oregon petition, which was signed twice in in, in 1997 and in 2008, and both uh, and it, it reached a number of over 31,000 scientists, basically saying they disagree with this. Uh, idea that global warming is a human-made problem, and uh, and we should uh, and the governments should should uh, do something against it. Now, thirty-one thousand scientists is not nothing. That is quite a a, a substantial number. It's, it's obviously um, given how many scientists there are, not a majority or whatever. But it, it is something that you cannot just uh, talk away. Uh, and among them are, of course, the very prominent scientists like Richard Linsen from the MIT. Uh, and um, Freeman Dyson from Princeton, uh, William Hapner from Princeton. So these are Ivy League professors who completely disagree on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the science uh, bit already, um, that uh, the official global warming um, uh, narrative is, is correct. Uh, but of course the most important bit about this whole consensus debate is that science is simply not about a consensus. It doesn't matter how many people agree on something, because many times throughout history, we have seen that the majority of op opinion um, of the experts was wrong. Science is very much about who has the best arguments. It's, it's about finding truth, and truth is not a matter of, of, of democracy, of, of ma majority. Uh, the most famous case for this is, of course, the falsification of Newton's physics by Einstein, who showed that there was a fundamental error in, in Newton's physics. Now, Newton's physics was, was far more accepted than 97% of scientists. It was uh, accepted for centuries uh, that it was just absolutely perfect, and, and, and people were impressed by how, how, how beautiful it, it is, but because everything fitted together so well. And then Einstein came along, who was not a professor at all. He worked at a patent office in Bern, and, and, uh, and challenged this, this, this narrative, and I think it's widely accepted now that he successfully uh, challenged uh, Newton's physics. So, and, and this is a good example of, of how science should work. It's not about how many people are shouting, it's who makes the best argument. So let's, let's look at the actual arguments. Um, now, as I said earlier, there are agreements on certain aspects of this, the whole science, which uh, I think um, I haven't heard good arguments against, so I'm going to assume as well that they are true. Uh, and these are basically three assumptions, and that is, first of all, that there is such a thing as a greenhouse effect. Um, I think this is uh, pretty well shown, this is basic physics. Uh, it has been, this effect has been known for basically 200 years. You can show it in a laboratory. It's, it's, it seems quite sound science to me. And well, Venus, I have no Venus reason. Venus has got a greenhouse effect. Huh? Venus, the planet Venus has got a greenhouse effect. Yeah, the Earth, Earth as well. Yeah. And so, it's, uh, so I think there is not really much doubt about the, the greenhouse effect itself. And uh, secondly, um, so that's the first thing that where I, I go uh, along with the consensus. The second thing I go along with is uh, that CO2 is indeed a greenhouse gas. Um, I think that's, I haven't heard any good arguments against this. And we, ha and we have, of course, enriched the atmosphere with CO2 by burning fossil fuels. Um, because, you know, fossil, that fossil fuels are carbon fuels and they mix up with the oxygen in the air and that produces CO2. And that CO2 has not been in the atmosphere for a very, very long time. So um, I accept that uh, burning of fossil fuels enriches the atmosphere with CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. Uh, and this has gone from about 280 uh, parts per million uh, with, uh, before the Industrial Revolution to now about 400 parts per million. Uh, so it's about a 40% increase so far in the atmosphere. And it's, it seems to be growing further and further. 
So this is, this is the second thing I, I do accept. And the third thing I do accept is that the best data we have on temperatures of the, of the planet seems to suggest that it has in, indeed gotten about one degree warmer during the last uh, century or so. Um, so that is a bit more tricky to, um, to know because where do you put the thermometer to, uh, to measure the, the Earth's temperature? Uh, and particularly if you, if you look at when these records started, people were not so concerned about measuring the climate to tens of degrees uh, Celsius pr uh, precision. They just wanted to know what the weather is. And if the, you know, if the weather, uh, it doesn't matter too much uh, whether it's 21.5 or 20.1.6 degrees. It, for all practical purposes, that's, that's irrelevant. So they didn't care too much about it. And uh, so these data is not very good, but it is the best data we have. And uh, it's reasonable, I think, to, to go with the best data you have. And the best data assumes that, uh, shows that it has warmed by about one degree. So where do I deviate from the, from the consensus? Um, what you hear a lot is on, on these three assumptions, you basically hear exactly uh, these three assumptions being put forward in, 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 in a way to say, look, we, we have a greenhouse effect, we're putting out greenhouse gases, therefore the atmosphere warms. There's no dispute about it. But this, I think, is, is quite false reasoning because it very much assumes that the atmosphere is some kind of linear system in which there is a direct relationship between an input and an output of, 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 of something like, like CO2. So you have a linear relationship between how much CO2 you put in on the one hand and how much temperature you get out on the other. But you can't make these simple um, correlations in a complex system. That's simply not possible. Um, and uh, if, we, if we were to do this, if we actually assume for a moment that there is a linear system, we actually don't get to uh, much of a problem, uh, which is interesting. Because the greenhouse e effect itself, which we understand, as I, as I um, said earlier, it's not that scary. The greenhouse effect itself with CO2 basically gives you, it's, it, it works roughly out to a, a logarithm, which means for every doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere, you get about one degree Celsius of, of temperature increases. So that means if we start with 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution, doubling that, we get to um, obviously, um, uh, that's 560, 560. Um, and uh, so we are now at 400, so we're not n nowhere near by doubling. But a doubling of, of that would just, if we isolate the greenhouse effect of CO2 on its own, we would get one degree warming if we get to 560. So if we, if we want to get another degree warming, we would not need to add another 280 to that. We would need to double that again. So we get to uh, 1120 before we get a second degree warming. For a third degree warming, we then have to double that again, and then we are over 2,000 2, uh, parts per million. Um, so you, you get the idea. You very quickly run into a wall where, you, where, you, where the amount of CO2 you're putting out in the atmosphere actually doesn't give you that much warming. In a, in a logarithmic um, algorithm, you get the most effect at the very beginning. And that, that effect is essentially in the first 280 parts per million that we already had before the Industrial Revolution. And it is widely assumed that the Earth is actually warmer uh, than it really should be because of greenhouse gases and the other side. Most importantly, of course, uh, water, water vapor, which is uh, rarely mentioned, uh, but also CO2 probably plays, plays a role in that. So that is the, the greenhouse effect on its own. The greenhouse effect on its own is therefore not that scary. And, 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 you can, and in order to, to assume that we get a massive warming, you have to assume that some elements in the atmosphere are amplifying that warming. Um, now, if they're amplifying that warming, then it's clear that also the people who are predicting more warming do not assume a linear relationship between CO2 and temperatures, because that's not a linear relationship. There must be some elements in the atmosphere that warming, that warming it quicker. And the reason why they assume that and there is a positive feedback from these other, other elements is because we haven't seen a doubling of CO2. We have seen a 40% increase of CO2, but it has already warmed by one degree. So how do you explain the more warming that we have seen from CO2? 
um, and they assume, well, the warming got exaggerated, uh, exaggerated by another factor. But of course, another explanation is simply, well, something else is warming in the atmosphere. It's not coming from CO2. Um, Um, so if, we, if you get into a complex system, then it becomes difficult to predict a system like this um, within a certain precision. I mean, you can, you can predict almost any system with, within a certain range. Uh, for example, I can absolutely with certainty, with almost certainty, predict the weather in London, the, the temperature in London in mid-July where we are. It, it's going to be somewhere between zero and 40 degrees. By, by, by pretty certainly. You know? Now you think, well, that's, that's not very precise, but it is, you know, within 40 degrees. Now the, the temperature range, of course, goes from minus 273.15, I believe, is absolute zero, to millions of degrees. So if you think about what, what's possible, that's actually a, an extremely precise prediction, if you think about it. But it's still useless because we want to know, if you want to know whether you go to the park on Sunday, um, uh, temperature range of 40 degrees doesn't help you very much. So you want to know it more, more precisely. And if you want to narrow it down, the more precise you get, the more difficult it becomes to predict the system to the point that at some point you, you just have to basically give up and, and say it's impossible to predict whether it's tomorrow it's going to be 30.3 or 30.4 degrees at 12 o'clock uh, in, in this square is, is impossible to predict because it's too complex to do this. So it all, all depends on how precisely do you want to predict your system. And where I got very skeptical with the, with the uh, whole global warming idea is that I heard politicians going on conferences and, and telling, telling me that um, they are going to limit the increase to 2 degrees Celsius, which is clearly in a range where the historic temperature of the atmosphere has never been stable. I mean, at the end of the last ice age, temperatures rose by about 7 degrees. So we have predictions within a range where the climate simply isn't stable. And doing that in a, in a complex system is, is extremely tricky to do. You basically need to know very, very precisely what the, how this system works in order to have any chance whatsoever. But even if you do know what's going on, chances are you still can predict it because you're, you're, you would need to have so precise data that you could practically never get. That's why, you know, with, with the weather, we cannot predict the weather for two weeks in advance. And we will probably never be able to do that because for that kind of precise weather prediction within the, the range, within a very precise range, of course, um, but for, for that kind of weather predictions, you would need to have so much data and so much computing power that it's simply not possible to do that. And, and I don't think we can really hope for much better weather predictions in the future, maybe a little bit. I actually read a really interesting paper about a month ago which supports what you just said, because what they wanted to do was use a supercomputer to model all the air molecules in about a room like this, you know, an average size room. And they said you can't do it. Yeah. It just wasn't there to go, even with a supercomputer or a super farm like um, Facebook has got 11 server farms up in northern Sweden sitting in the ice pack to cool off. You couldn't do it there either. The computing that's required is just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, yeah. and, I mean, and that, that was very sobering for me. Yeah. Because I said to myself, well, if, that, if you're left with statistics mm -hmm. and you know that basically the problem with statistics is these means, which don't tell you how the outliers are behaving, and then you really have a huge problem. So I just want yeah. to make yeah. that. Yeah. Let's to discussion because Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, thanks for the point of view. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's exactly right. You, you have to accept that there are limits to how much you can, can predict certain systems. And even if you understand these systems very well, even if, if, if there are no knowledge gaps in the physics involved and whatever, yeah. you still can't predict it. And when I hear people predicting temperatures for 100 years uh, in, in one or two degrees, I think that's, on the face of it, that's, that, that cannot be a, a serious science to me. Uh, and, and that's my basic skepticism, because I'm not a climate scientist. I don't, I don't understand the, the, the details of these models. I just, but I do understand something about complex systems, because I'm, I'm interested in physics. And uh, I do understand that why I'm constantly um, 
uh, stuck by how bad the weather predictions are, which uh, you can absolutely not rely on, at least not in, in, in Britain, because it's, it's too complex. They're, they're not idiots at, at, at the Met Office or whatever to predict these things. They're just, it, it's not possible. What they're trying to do is, is really, really difficult to do. And uh, so that's my main skepticism. But no matter how much you understand about any scientific theory, I think the most important thing you need to understand about science is that any scientific theory needs to be able to predict the future. And that's how you can test any theory. Even if you know nothing about a, a, a scientific theory, if a scientist tells you when A, then B, and then you, you see that C follows on, on uh, to A and not B, you know that there's something wrong with that theory, even if you know nothing else about it. Because clearly, it doesn't predict what it should predict. So for a long time, the, uh, the uh, climate uh, debate uh, was basically hiding behind the fact that they were, uh, that they were making very long-term predictions, which couldn't yet be, uh, be uh, tested. And, and that's very comfortable. You, you say, well, no, it's, it's a real scientific theory. It's just we have to wait 50 years in order for it to be tested. But now we have this theory around for, for like three decades, and we actually can now see how, how well these climate models, which are supposed to be settled science, we are told everywhere. So the, the science is settled. So how well do these climate models actually predict the temperatures of the last 30 years just? If I'm right, and it is very difficult, I would, I would expect their track record to be quite, quite bad. And a, a climatologist from the University of uh, Alabama by the name of John Christie has uh, taken all the cl climate models that, that, uh, um, that are around and put them into a graph and compared them to the actual temperature record. And this is what he found. Uh, any of these lines, I don't, I don't know if you can see this, any of these lines is a prediction of, one, of, of, of a climate model. Now the first thing to notice is it's a settled science and yet they all seem to pretty much disagree with each other, which is uh, weird for a settled science. I mean, if you, if you wanted to shoot a rocket to Mars and you asked 10 physicists to calculate the, 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 the you know, they wouldn't come up with 10 slightly different, uh, different ways of doing it. They would pretty much agree how to do this. Uh, if, if they're worth their, their, their money, because that, that is as, as good as science can be settled, I think that is settled science, and that, that is how good theory looks like. Well, they don't even agree with each other. Um, now, to be fair, I mean, these are, these are the, the means of the, of the predictions. Every of the models does predict a range of, of temperatures, so it, it just took the means, and uh, they all have the same tendency, which is up. Now, what, what did really happen? What did really happen is those down here, measured by different ways with satellites and, and weather balloons, but pretty much we're getting a, a flat line because that's what happened since the uh, late 1990s. Temperatures has, haven't gone up that much. Mm -hmm. And you can see my, my suspicion that it's very difficult to predict uh, complex systems has been uh, uh, validated here because they are pretty much all wrong. None got it right. Uh, which is pretty impressive, given you know how many there are. You would think someone would get it right by guessing at least, but no, they they really got it all wrong. Um, and you, you you can also see how they got it wrong, which is they all uh, overestimated the warming. They all predicted a warming that never happened. Now, to be absolutely fair, because this is a range, some of the very low predictions here the actual temperatures were at the very bottom of, of that range, on, on the very kind of uh, least likely event uh, for, for, these, for these predictions. Now, that is better than nothing, but not much better, I would, I would argue. Uh, so I think this validates my point, my, my suspicion I had already 20 years ago, that um, predicting the climate will be very, very, very difficult to do. And... Um, so far, they're not doing a, a, a very good job doing this. Now, I want to I want to be clear though. I, I hear I hear a lot of critics of, of of global warming saying that this proves global warming isn't happening. I wouldn't quite go that far because uh, we might see an upshoot in temperatures in the future. Just because it has gone flat right now doesn't mean it go, doesn't mean it it will go, it won't go up in the future because that would mean you would need to understand the climate quite precisely to make such a prediction that it can't warm. And I don't think we, we do uh, understand the climate that well. And complex systems can, 
can behave in very very funny ways. A good good example of that is an is an avalanche, for example, snow avalanche, where for a very long time nothing happens. Snow just you know builds up at the top and it looks very peaceful, and then suddenly out of the blue all hell breaks loose, uh, which is. Uh, Impossible to predict when it's going to break this, but it's it's going to shoot up. So something like that could absolutely happen, you know. I'm, so I'm not I'm not convinced that we won't see any warming, but I am convinced that it will be very very difficult to predict warming if it if it's going to happen, because uh, the climate is a complex system. So that's my that's my uh, first answer to the first thesis. Is it real? To which I I say, we don't know. We, all we know, we're putting out some, some CO2, and that might or might not have an effect. How big that effect is, we don't know. And at that point, of course, a lot of people will say, yeah, okay, fair enough. Maybe it's sort of settled and not as certain as, as it's usually portrayed. But given that we know that if, it's, if it were to happen, it's, it would be such a huge problem. Wouldn't, isn't, isn't, it, isn't it best to just play it safe, you know, to... To just assume it will happen and then react to uh, react to it, uh, then try to prevent that problem from 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 happening, uh, because it will be such a disaster if it if it were to happen. Well, that brings us to the second assumption, which is: is it a problem? Um, which I'm not terribly um, uh, convinced that it is. Um, one of the predictions, of course, is one one of the phrases you hear a lot in this debate is that. A warmer planet is a more dangerous planet. Um, so, it's it seems since we like to test you know uh, scientific theories, it seems reasonable to to assume well we have got a degree warming, and apparently every degree counts. So if we have got a degree warming in the last century, so what has happened? Is the planet more dangerous now, or or not? And um, I found a very very interesting statistic uh, by in in, in a book. Um, called uh, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, which is, uh, which is really a, a good book. It's not his own statistic. He got it from the World Bank, which is not a climate skeptical uh, organization. Um, and what, what they simply looked at is climate-related deaths. How do they develop in the last 100 years when, it, when we've gotten one degree warm? Uh, if, if it's true that a warmer planet is more dangerous, uh, then we would expect to see them at least not decreasing, but really we would see maybe a slight increase of, of climate-related deaths. And this statistic is interesting because it's quite, uh, quite impressive, because not only have we not gotten an increase of climate-related deaths, it has gone uh, down, and, and it has gone down quite, quite significantly. It has gone down by 98%. We have now 98% less people dying from climate-related uh, causes than we had 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, 90 years ago, when the statistics start. Um, and that, although in that time, apparently, everyone agrees, the climate has warmed. So that seems to be a bit puzzling, uh, because it seems to contradict the narrative that a warmer planet is more dangerous. Now, I'm not suggesting that that one degree Celsius of, of, of outside temperature saves that many lives. The, the reason why less people are dying in absolute numbers, even though we have much more people now on the, on the planet. Um, the reason is somewhat related to that, though, because in, in bottom line is uh, we're now burning more fossil fuels, and that's what's saving all these lives. It's, uh, it's, um, it ha basically has to do with that the, most, uh, the, the biggest cause for climate-related deaths uh, famines, where, where people starve to death, because before we used fossil fuels on a big, uh, on a huge scale, uh, we basically were pretty reliant to grow food pretty near to us, so that we could transport it quickly enough to the to the consumer, because otherwise it would would, would go bad, and uh, and that was a huge problem before fossil fuels came along, because you had very primitive means to 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 transport things. Uh, but thanks to fossil fuels, we now have huge, um, we, we can uh, refrigerate food, we can freeze it, and we can transport it on, on container ships with uh, lorries and with, um, with planes. They all run on, on fossil fuels. And that has basically 
eliminated the danger of people starving if, if the weather isn't good in, in, in your region. Unless, of course, you have some kind of political problem, there, like a war or in North Korea where the dictator just doesn't allow food in and, and, and stuff like that, which is obviously stupid. But um, that's, that's something uh, that's a different problem. Um, and so it is not the one degree uh, increase, but it has to do with, uh, with burning fossil fuels, which seems to be quite a good thing. Now, what is, what is the argument for the climate uh, warming being a problem? Uh, it, basically, the argument seems to assume that right now the, the planet has some kind of optimal temperature, that if we, if we deviate from this optimal temperature, uh, we are all screwed. Uh, but, but why would you assume that now the temperature has, is, 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 is optimal? Now, I can see places on, on the planet which are already quite hot. And not everyone likes uh, heat. Um, as you can see in London right now, it's, it's, it's quite warm and uh, I love it. But I, I meet a lot of people who don't like it. So, and this is just 30 degrees. You have, of course, places in, in India and in Africa and, um, where you, you can get heat waves to like 50 degrees. And, and as much as I like heat, 50 degrees is also for me a bit too warm. That's quite dangerous. Uh, you, can, you can definitely die from that. And people die in these heat waves. So, of course, if you, if you have a heat wave for 50 degrees and you add another 5 degrees, that doesn't make things better. That, that significantly makes things worse. I can see that. That is a local problem of, 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 of a war. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that there, there can't be any, any problems from, from a changing climate. There are. But like with all problems, I think you need to, have to, you need to look at both sides of, of the balance sheet. You cannot just look... Because most things in life have good and, and bad sides. And, and usually how we deal with them, we, we look at both sides and then weigh what is, are the benefits bigger than the, than the um, disadvantages of something. Uh, and, and, and that's how we make a decision whether something is good or bad. In the climate debate, we don't do this. We look at things that are a problem and, and, and that's, that's it. That's basically saying, look, there's a problem, we, we can't have it. But on the other side, of course, there are benefits from, from warming because right now, most of the planet is actually probably too cold. If you look to uh, north where we are, north of England, the, the Scottish border is around um, 6,000 uh, kilometers from the equator. From there, it is another 4,000 to the pole. If you draw a line to the north of England and look what's, what's north of that line, you, you find there's very, very little civilization going on. There are some smaller cities, you know. I think the biggest cities are in, well, <laughs> Scotland, you can... <laughs> but they are just about... Just about. In the Netherlands of Scotland. Netherlands of Scotland. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I'm not against Scots. <laughs> But I'm just saying, there are not that many people living above that line. I mean, not even Moscow is above that line. You have St. Petersburg above that line, Helsinki, some Scandinavian uh, cities. But they are also as, as far south. I mean, if you look into Sweden and, and Norway, you know, the biggest cities, as far as they have big cities, they are very south. They are not, they are not in the north. And uh, if, if you look to, like, uh, Canada, for example, uh, I mean, Canada is, I think, bigger than, from territory-wise, bigger than the U.S., and, of course, the population is like one-tenth of the U.S. And there's one reason for that, and one reason only for that, but it's too cold. Uh, most of that, that is, uh, land is just too cold to live on. And uh, if you look at where, where Canadians live, they live very, very close to the U.S. down there in, in, uh, on the southern border, because that's basically the only little strip where you, where you can live. Um, if, if I look in, uh, to where people want to live, I don't see them massively moving uh, to places like Alaska, for example, which, you know, Alaska even pays people to live there. They have a basic income going on from the oil that's, that, that they have. So you would think people would flock to Alaska, but they don't flock to Alaska. What they're flocking to is California, Texas, Nevada, Florida, <coughs> all the hot places in the South. That's where, where, where people live because we are fundamentally tropical animals. And the evidence seems to suggest to, uh, to me that we're doing much better in warm weather than we're doing in cold weather. I mean, if you look into the history of, of, of humankind, 
we have always struggled with climate. Climate has always been a huge problem to us. But we have even survived in, in very, very hot, hot weather like uh, the Sahara. As long as you have access to water, which you have around the, the Nile, for example, you see big uh, civilizations going up. Because it's not the heat, it's the lack of water that, that, is, that might be a problem. But as soon as you can solve that, a desert climate is actually quite, quite, quite nice and, and livable. Um, and of course, access to water can be uh, can be solved by you know by energy and 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 ways to to get just get the water where you need it to be. We we have all the technology for that available. So you often hear that desertification of the planet is a huge problem, and you say, why? People like to live in deserts. All the evidence seems to suggest it's actually quite nice in, in a desert as long as you have access to water and you might want to have an air condition, which is all a, a question of how much energy you have available. The only continent humans have never conquered until very recently is Antarctica. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's a cold place on, on the planet that, that are the biggest problem for us. It's not the warm places. And yet we are told that if the planet warms from here, we have a huge disaster. What's the argument for that? I think the best argument that you can make for a disaster case is that glaciers will melt and uh, will in, you know, let sea levels rise. That might be a problem for, for because humans tend to settle along coastlines. You, you have a lot of big cities on coasts. Um, and if sea levels rise by several meters, and the, the scare scenario is that the ice in Greenland will melt. Yeah. If all of the ice in Greenland melts, we get an, a, a sea level increase of about seven meters. Now, seven meter sea level increase, I can see that that is a problem for people who settle in the coast. Big cities like New York, for example, you are, as far as I remember, New York is pretty flat, right? Uh, yeah. So that will, be, that will be underwater. But of course, how big that problem is also depends in how fast is it happening. A seven meter sea level rise in 10 years is a huge problem. That, that will cost us an enormous amount because I don't think in 10 years you can even build the dikes, the, the, the dikes that, that quickly that to, to protect the cities. You basically have to flee the water. So that would be a huge problem. Seven meters in 10,000 years? I'm not sure if that's uh, such a problem because most people would just over generations move more and more inland. And big cities, you would probably build dikes uh, around, which you know co doesn't, don't cost that much. I calculated, if, if you want to build a dike uh, around New York for seven meters high, uh, 200 miles long, that would cost about $50 billion. Uh, $50 billion for a big city within you know decades investment that's that's a drop in the bucket as far as I'm as far as I can tell so and I think that is already the, the most scary scenario is that um, uh, we get some time of sea level rise because all the other stuff yes there will be local problems like you know warm places will be even warmer but these are not problems um, that are unsolvable which gets me to the last assumption, which is uh, it's always assumed the only possible way to deal with a, with a global warming problem is we have to prevent it. There's clearly no other way to, to, to deal with this. We have to prevent it. Um, and you think, well, why? Uh, why not deal with the consequences of, 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 of warming? Uh, for example, if you have a heat wave, why, why not you know, try to get these people an air con so that they can hide from the heat wave. That seems to be a much practical and uh, much more practical and cheap solution than trying to control the temperature of the whole planet, which seems a, a crazy thing to do. I mean, if you, if you think, you know, politicians, they have trouble delivering the mail and they're meeting on conferences <laughs> and, and determine what, what temperature the whole planet should have. I mean, it's just on the face of it quite ridiculous if you, if you, if you think about it. Um, but, but that's the world we live in. I mean, they're seriously doing that all the time. Um, I think, I think uh, and, and here I think where go, uh, is where the, the climate debate goes most wrong. You can argue about the science, you know. I don't know what's going to happen, as I, I just said. But yeah, I can see there is a case that it, maybe it gets warmer. You can argue about the problems, which, you know, I'm willing to admit a changing climate will cause local problems, absolutely. But one thing is really crazy uh, to me is to suggest that controlling the temperature of 
the, of the planet is the best and, and most economic solution to deal with this problem. That is just absolutely nuts. Because in order to do that, we would actually need to use less fossil fuels. And I just quoted these statistics. It's fossil fuels that have prevented us from, from dying from the, from the climate, like nothing else. Um, and we are told that we should give up this solution, which clearly works. And which is not just uh, something uh, that, that works now, you know. Adapting to climate is, is basically the success story of the, of the human race. We are tropical animals. We, as far as we know, come from Africa at some point. And, we, and, and you know, uh, when north, I think, yeah, pretty much north, it's the only way to use from No, but east, yeah, yeah, They say, like, like, that's the wall north. Mm. That's what they say. Yeah, no. It's too cold. It's too cold. <laughs> so, so if if these if these people would have said, "Look, guys, stop. We, we we can't go on here because we first need to find a way to make it warmer here," they would have never gotten anywhere. Uh, instead, what they did is, you know, they put some fur on and protect themselves against the cold, and, and that that is a much better solution. And it is the way we conquer the planet. We deal with the consequence. We don't try to uh, control everything. We we just deal with with very concrete co uh, consequences. Which makes uh, which 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 works quite brilliantly. I mean, you can even live in a climate like like in England, which people people like to complain about the, the weather, and we can joke about it now because we have all this nice technology. But most of the time, not not today is an exception, and this summer is maybe an exception. But most of the time, the weather is not just bad in this country. It's 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 deadly. If you were out there naked as you are, as nature has made you. Um, you wouldn't last 24 hours most, uh, most of the year. This weather kills you. The reason why we don't experience it as a deadly weather is because we have so convenient and so good technology like clothes, like heating, and so on, that the weather is actually quite livable. It's, uh, you can complain about it a little bit, but no one is scared of it, that's, that's for sure. And that's what you do if you deal with the consequence. Now, the costs of of stop burning fossil fuels would be enormous for the simple reason that it's um, it's the access to cheap energy and an energy source needs to have three characteristics in order for us to be really valuable it needs to be cheap reliable and plentiful those three characteristics if, if it misses one of them we have a we have a problem and there aren't that many energy sources at the moment that are cheap uh, plentiful and reliable. There are basically two. It's, it's fossil fuels and it's nuclear. And nuclear always only gives us ele electricity <coughs> at the moment. Um, so electricity is a, is a minority of the energy we're using. It makes in, a, in an average country about 20 to 25% of the energy. The rest is basically mostly fossil fuels. If we were to significantly reduce that, our standard of living would absolutely go south very, very quickly. And that's why, you know, this problem, as I said, has been, has been described as a problem for, for decades now. And what has happened in these decades, we have increased our, 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 our CO2 emission pretty much everywhere. Why is that? Are, are politicians too stupid to see uh, that, that this is a problem or whatever? Everyone pays lip service to this problem, and yet no one seems to do anything about it. And why is that? Because you can't. If you actually were to Get, become serious about reducing CO2 emissions without having any kind of good alternatives, you would very quickly see uh, voters chasing you out with pitchforks because you, you can't survive this politically. Uh, the the standard of living would just go absolutely south immediately. You can't do this. And everyone is, is, uh, is basically working on burning more fossil fuels because what we actually need is even more cheap energy to increase our standards of living even more, and that's what's popular. So this whole talk that this is an, this is a a possibility to to prevent climate change, whatever whatever CO two does to the atmosphere, is a complete illusion. This 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 possibility doesn't even exist, and yet not only is this not acknowledged, we get, we are being told. It's the only possible solution. All these nutters that suggest we should do what we, what we have done for thousands of years, and which is the success story of humans, which is adapt to climate, that we should continue doing that, um, those, those are literally described as nutters in, in, in the media. 
And instead, we should abandon that towards a solution which has never worked, which is control the temperature of, of the planet, which uh, I don't think there have been any successful attempts of doing that. Um, I mean, maybe rain dancing and these kind of things, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not that successful, this, this strategy. Um, so that is the most crazy, crazy bit. And I, 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 I labeled my talk um, a simple case for hope. It's, I, 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 will, I wanted to try to make it a, a simple case in the sense that I'm not a climate scientist. I just want to um, put some holes into the official narrative from a very simplistic, easy to understand perspective which um, I think you don't need to look far to, to put holes in the official narrative. And I'm really hopeful because I don't think that whatever the climate does, we have all the technology available to deal with pretty much any consequence we like. Um, in a room like this, you can have any climate you like, no matter what's, what's outside. Uh, we even survive in outer space these days, which has much more uh, radical climates. Um, and it's, it's not a problem. So we, we can survive any climate uh, we want, the only, only um, thing is we need to have access to cheap energy. And the only thing that might scare me is that politicians might prevent us from using cheap energy. That's the real danger. And if they actually succeed in doing that, then we have a problem. But it's not coming from climate, it's coming from, politi from politicians. The climate itself will be fine because we have great engineers who will come up with great solutions to whatever problem we are facing. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there any questions? Mr. John. Um, you didn't touch upon the fact that we're in an interglacial at the moment. And uh, in fact, the next <coughs> glacial period is overdue. Mm -hmm. And if it comes, it may last for millennia, and that would be a vastly worse problem for human beings mm. than, than any of the worst predictions of global warming. And therefore, if global warming is true and is anthropocentric, we've discovered a potential way of staving off this utter disaster mm. of glaciation. Um, uh, uh, we just got to not overdo it. Mm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, from, from I mean, of course, past is not prologue. So just because we had lots of uh, ice ages in the past doesn't mean we will see it in the future. But it, it seems reasonable to assume that we just are in an interglacial and, and we're seeing another ice age at at, at some not too distant distant point. But um, but you're right. I mean, as I pointed out, all the evidence seems to suggest that cold is much worse for humans than warm and our civilizations only started to flourish when the last ice age went, uh, went away because we are around for, for, for quite a bit longer and we never never made it made it really in this world until the planet got warmer and, and we, we finally uh, could, 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 could flourish. So in my, in my view, warm seems to be better for us and, and I, I'm actually, that's why I was saying at the beginning, I mean, the temperature staying as it is might be a problem in the sense that I actually think there's a good case that we are right now have a overall a, a little bit a too cold planet. It would be quite a good thing if, if, it, if it were to warm, even from this level, let alone preventing an ice age, of course. That, that would be an utter disaster if it, if it uh, came back. Could I just say something else in support of that? Um, there's a thing called the Maunder Minimum. Mm -hmm. okay. That was when the temperature got so cold in the UK, the Thames froze over. Mm -hmm. okay? So. Like my friend here said, basically, I don't believe global warming is a problem that everybody presents it as. To me, it's the glacier and the cold that's coming that's going to be the real problem and the headache. Because, like you said yourself, we're going to need the fossil fuels to keep the planet warm. In a sense, um, I think that what you find with a lot of climate people who are scientists is that they, they get politically biased. And... I've seen it time and time again. They refuse to discuss the fact that Venus, with no factories, is the best example of global warming and runaway global warming that we have in the solar system. That is a global warming planet. That is that is virtually put everything, whatever there was on it, as life, is extinct now. Because the temperatures are just so hot that
But by the time you put a space probe in and it lands on the surface, it's just a globule of metal. It's just a pool of liquid metal. Mm -hmm. I think um, basically uh, we are heading for a, a very cold spell. There's another thing now which has cropped up to support the more and more the minimum graph, which is that warming is not an issue, which is um, sunspot activity. Now, what's been alarming a lot of astrophysicists who watch the sun as a hobby and a business is basically the sunspot activity has pretty much died away. They're not seeing any sunspots on the surface. Now, for those people who don't understand what a sunspot is, they're, they're black spots. They're about the diameter. I mean, you could actually drop the entire planet Earth down a tube. And a lot of people speculate, and they've done models which show that basically they're probably mathematical rings, uh, toruses, uh, mathematical magnetic toruses. And basically, they actually release a lot of heat from the inside of the sun. The way it works is this. The, the photons take an awful long time to leave the centre of the sun to get to the surface, then to take the eight-minute journey to the surface of the atmosphere. Yeah. Now, the, the theory is basically, and they can't, and they have solar satellites now orbiting the sun, looking at it to go and test the thesis. But the sunspots are switched off. But the, the theory was originally that the sunspots were disproportionately heating everything in the solar system by allowing a shortcut for the photons to get off the sun, uh, out, of, out from the interior. And um, basically, I, I just don't see how the global warming thing comes in because another thing that, that is ignored in a lot of the climate models is the contribution that the interior of the Earth makes from a heat source point of view. Um, because we know that it's fusion that's going on down there at the center of the Earth, and that's for the heat issue, convection causes tectonic plate movements, hot magma rises, you have Yellowstone magma reservoirs, you have Lake Tauhau. That never freezes. Lake, anybody who's visited Lake Tauhau in the winter like I have, the, the lake never freezes. It's a thousand feet deep, right? That's the limit that you can put a nuclear submarine down. And it never freezes all the way to the bottom because the, there's magma down there 20 kilometers below it which is keeping that water sufficiently warm to uh, make sure it never freezes. So a lot of the climate models ignore the interior of the Earth and the contribution it makes to CO2 production in terms of melting hydrates in the ocean. Adjusting the oceans as a heat sink because the oceans absorb a lot of heat. And um, the other thing that's missing from a lot of the climate models is the contribution of sunspots <coughs> and the sun itself. <coughs> And on top of that, you have another issue which has been raised by astrophysicists, which is a lot of the, as the solar system goes round Sag A, the center of the Milky Way, um, over 250,000 years, it passes through dust clouds. So the, the density of dust, the material that we pass through, changes as we go. On top of that, you've got magnetic reversals of the sun, haven't you, every 11 years? And You've also got the magnetic reversal of the Earth, which is long overdue as well. Um, so, I mean, the thing I want to make is the point that you've made, which is basically global warming is not the problem, it's the freezing that's coming that's going to be the problem. Yeah, I'm assuming that it, that is coming. And my, my main point was that I don't understand the climate and I don't think they do. And what you, what you just said is, is exactly right. There are all kinds of uncertainties in climate models and, and things they don't consider to be relevant and so on. And if you want to predict, uh, you know, predicting complex systems is difficult enough. But you only have a chance if you really understand them well. And we don't even understand this one well. Uh, because there are all these things that I, I ignored. And yet we, they pretend completely that we understand it so well that we, that we know exactly how to interfere in, in this system to, uh, to, to get a very, very precise outcome. And that's, that's a ridiculous bit. But yeah, I, 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 I take your point. I'm more scared of a, of a, of a cooling would, would much more bother me than uh, and most people on this planet. Than, Do you think the cooling is more likely? I mean, from what you've read yourself? Well, it depends on, on, the, on, on the time frame. Um, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of hundred years, probably. I think from a very long perspective, thousands of years, 
I, I'm, I'm buying into the idea that we are an interglacial and we're probably going to face Fred it. Fred Singer, uh, I think his name is, is the expert, yeah. one of the leading experts, he's predicting decades. He said in a few decades it might stop. Mm. So we may only have discovered global warming in time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, d I don't know. I'm, I'm well, skeptical about these kind of predictions, but yeah. yeah. Can we, we have should, some light here or something? Yeah, can you switch light on, please? Yeah. Uh, Richard? Oh, yeah, um, great talk. Um, I wonder what your view is um, of the prospect of the geoengineering as a solution to climate change. For example, the uh, United Nations could hire a fleet of aircraft that could spray chemicals in the you know, there are lots of these geoengineering ideas to try and reverse global warming. They're, they're actually relatively low cost yeah. compared with getting out fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, the problem there is, you, you, again, you're interfering in a complex system and you don't know what the result is going to be. So they, they basically, I, I'm not buying into, I, I think it's, it's very, very difficult to predict this system. Uh, I, I keep coming back to this. That's why I'm also quite skeptical about a, a prediction like we have decades to... <coughs> who knows? We, I, as far as I know, we don't quite fully understand interglacials. We have some theories and maybe this is a good test for it. Uh, but um, uh, with geoengineering, yeah, maybe maybe that might. Maybe something needs to relay. Perhaps something needs to relay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, at current usage, we have about another 2,000 years of, of supply. I can thank you for all this. So, so yeah, I, I think, um, to your point, I think we have, this is nothing we should worry about in the next few decades or, or, or centuries. We have plenty of, of fossil fuels. Uh, we probably don't have them at, at very cheap prices. I think the cheapest fossil fuels are probably there, but, you know, at, at the, the price we have right now, 70, uh, dollars or a hundred dollars, there's plenty of oil uh, around. And we're getting better and better in, in digging them out of the ground, so we have better and better technologies for this. There's also an interesting thing happening now with graphene, um, because what they've discovered is if they put two layers of graphene and just switch them with one degree difference, mm -hmm. it superconducts. So this promises um, the ability to make superconducting cables. Zero resistance, no voltage drops, no losses which are significant. From a power station to your house, it's probably a 30% voltage drop, so you lose all that energy. Now, as to what that gentleman said when the fossil fuels run out, I mean, I think that the alternative ways of using energy more efficiently will probably counterbalance that. So hold on, hold on. The entire room just bought into the theory that there's a finite amount of fossil fuels with zero evidence. Your ability to see the entire Earth, is this well, a fact? I mean, you're you skeptical of all these other facts and then then all of a sudden, oh, well, there's definitely a finite amount of fossil fuels, that's for sure, and we just moved on from that? Well, I don't know, in this fantasy world of no climate change, uh, I would say fossil fuels shouldn't run out either. Well, I think the planet, everything on the planet is, is finite in some ways. So, fossil fuels are finite because they're fossils. Other fuels might not be. We might be able to engineer, f uh, to, to produce fuels. Uh, we have already. Nuclear power isn't finite. No. Nuclear fast breather. No, no, uh, but, but that's some fossil fuels. Um, uh, fossil fuels are uh, finite in a, in a very technical sense, but we have access to more and more of them because we, we discover more and more ways of digging them out of the ground. Natural gas has uh, yeah. come in and... Uh, yeah, and, 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 yeah, I mean, natural gas, you can, of course, produce natural gas uh, artificially very easily. The problem is you lose about 60% of your energy, which makes it not very productive. Uh, um, productive to do this at our electricity costs that we have. If we were to discover a very cheap energy source, even if it's, if it's a local energy source that we can have mobile, but if it's cheap enough, then we can, of course, start producing these things artificially. And uh, so I don't think we run out of fuels, but we eventually we run out of fossil fuels. John? Uh, I think it's been disputed that oil is in fact a fossil fuel rather than something. 
Yeah, there is a, there's a theory yeah. there. In, in which case, case, if we can crack that technology, then uh, we can it will them. no longer be the case that there's no fuel like an old fuel. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas Gold was, uh, Thomas, Thomas Gold was, uh, 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 yeah, so um, one thing that always annoyed me about this, and maybe you have some good counter evidence to it, uh, so no, it doesn't feel like it's a hypothesis that is falsifiable in any way, right? So any, any proper scientific theory, there has to be some way to prove it wrong. Right, and you know, for like the last 20 years, whether it's getting hot, getting hotter, it's global warming. They're getting colder, global warming. Droughts, well, floods. Well, it's not global warming. They, they, it's now climate change because they changed to climate change because uh, because it, it gets embarrassing. The data just didn't show show up. That that is true. If if you call it climate change. Then it's then, unfalsifiable. Then it's unfalsifiable. <laughs> if you call it global warming, then it is falsifiable. Because then, if it doesn't get warm, it is. But which is essentially what happened. <laughs> my question was: Do you, do you have you read about any? Have they tried to offer any way to falsify it? Well, global warming. If it doesn't get warmer, it's, it's no, no, climate change. No, no, climate change. If if you just have a change in climate, that that means change in in the way zero change is also a, a special case of, of changing so then any po any possible change is covered by that and then you, you can falsify it now that's very handy it is very handy and you know this whole the reason why this debate is not uh, scientific is because it's just it's just a great political uh, theory you can you can get so much political capital out of it's it a because I, I, yeah, I think I think there's one there's one book um, called Watermelons by uh, James Stellingpole, which is not a particularly good book, but I think the analogy is 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 spot on. I think the whole communist movement, when it became more more clear that communism isn't working, changed to green because green essentially anything in the economy, pretty much anything, uses energy. So if you can have an argument for controlling energy, you control the economy, and that's why they like it. And in the interesting thing about this whole debate is that it's a very emotional debate. People are not happy if you tell them it's not a problem. They want it to be a problem because their whole political agenda is now based on global warming. As I said at the very beginning, I go to a lot of political meetings. And always, 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 if you find kind of people who are on the more socialist interventionist side, they at some point bring up global warming because it's 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 at the center of their ideology. And they're genuinely disappointed when it doesn't happen, right? You yeah. Think, you think they'd be happy? Yeah. The problem solved. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, uh, Nico. Thank you for your talk. Um, it strikes me that we have this thing called sustainable energy, which is tidal power, wind power, that's the reason. But for a lot of the time. The generation is surplus to requirement because the wind's too strong or it's too much tide or current or whatever. And this is a real waste of potential energy, which no one can complain about, and that would be the electrolysis of water, even seawater, to hydrogen and oxygen, um, blow off the oxygen or bottle it, and the hydrogen can be used for, uh, quotes, carbon, it's not carbon, no, uh, a fuel supply for cars and for all sorts of things that need to have uh, uh, easy and easily stored energy. Uh, and uh, this would mean we're not wasting our sustainable generators. So we talking about that since the 18th century, the tremendous energy in water. What you're talking about is fuel cell technology? Yes. And what this, uh, without bringing it up again, because it's turning into the magic material, right? Yeah. Graphene is brilliant because it will actually allow electrons through once you've made the, the, the graphene tube or whatever, but it blocks the protons. So what they're doing now is they're using graphene to build really more efficient fuel cells. So you could find in another five or 10 years, I mean, this material, the British government are absolute idiots. They, really, they gave 10 million pounds to Manchester. So, uh, could, and basically- Could, could, could you, you could go back in turn, but just want to- Sorry, sorry. Uh, John and then Paul. Oh, right. Um, I wanted to put in a bad word for the uh, academics. Um, because they have something like what is called uh, academic freedom, 
is that the expression of something like that? Um, you, you think, well, you know, they can't be manipulated, but all of the universities around the entire world are state regulated. You can't call yourself a university, you can't award a degree without government permission. Uh, predominantly state funded, almost everywhere. And uh, state funding then goes to those departments which are pursuing what is politically favoured in terms of global warming, also cancer research and various other things. So um, the whole system has been completely captured by politics and then it becomes self-reinforcing because in order to get on, you've got to come up with the same stuff as everybody else. But well, occasionally something breaks free. Uh, somebody like, who wrote The Red Queen? Uh, Matt Ridley. Matt Ridley, Ridley yeah. yeah. I mean, and he's one of the people who uh, there are some independent thinkers, but they tend to be not completely caught up in the university. He, I think it was, who said, because there has been some slight global warming, there now more land is available to us than was. He did it, actually did a calculation. There is more land available now because of the global warming. And so, as you said, you were sure, who's to say that? We're at the right temperature now. He said, actually, a bit warmer does seem to be better. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, the, the corruption in, in, in science is, it seems pretty obvious. I wouldn't start the argument there, though. Uh, it's an explanation you have after you've realized that something is wrong. Because if you start with a the conspiracy theory, people will dismiss you. Uh, you. You need to start with the actual argument. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's obvious. I mean, yesterday I wrote a, uh, I wrote, uh, I read a, an, uh, a headline in, in the Independent saying that uh, scientists have now discovered a link between global warming and the higher suicide rates we have. And I think, okay, someone needed some funding for some stupid uh, research project, which, you know, I mean, how can you, how can you possibly... Wait, was it global warming or higher temperatures? Uh-huh. Global was, warming. He said specifically it was global yeah, warming, I, I not remember. just higher temperatures? No, I think... So that's how you get your funding. Yeah, that's how you get your funding. Yeah, global warming into science. Yeah, and, and, and then it doesn't you get... I have, I have a good friend in... in what was in, the type? Huh? It doesn't make any sense. But, well, it it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's my point. Higher temperatures make sense. I can see the causation. The independent. Independent. I can see the causation. This business of global warming is making so depressed that we're committing suicide. I don't think that was it. I think it was higher temperatures. So, no, 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 it was, well, that's not what the headline says. Um, but, but you get these kind of, uh, of, of signs all the time that, uh, that all kinds of things are linked to global warming. And the reason is they want to get funding. And I know this for, for a fact because, you know, if you, if you talk to academics, they will tell you that they somehow trying to link things to global warming. So that if, if you know these people, it's very open. It, it's, it's an open secret that that's how you get funding. I have a very good friend in, in Germany who is a professor for microbiology. He's an expert in wine. And he, he sees that if he, if he wants to get funding, or one of his students wants to get funding for anything, link to global warming, because that's how you get the fund. That's where the money is. And so it's, 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 it's openly corrupted, this, this, this whole system. And uh, I think there are certain sciences that are, more, that are more affected with others. I think there are sciences who are probably fine when, if you're doing theoretical physics or whatever, they leave you alone. But yeah, global warming uh, and, and, of course, economics is completely... Um, Corrupted and, and these these subjects. All these scientists agree that global warming then is is a huge problem. It's somewhat like uh, uh, you know ninety nine percent of priests think that the Pope is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's just one aspect of the corruption. The, the other corruption is that anybody who dares venture an opinion that global warming or climate change had to pretend to be caused isn't true, is of course blackmailed and persecuted and shunned and Pretty. mocked and uh, <laughs> sidelined. And so there's, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge, yeah, there's a, there's a huge, I mean, it's, it's all of course denier as well. This is what we want to do. So there's a huge, there's a huge, the corruption goes by there's funding for agreeing, there's ostracism and abuse for failing to agree, you know, that especially if you're a popular television science, scientist like mm -hmm. uh, say David Attenborough or David Bellamy, I think both of them at one time 
said they were, didn't understand or weren't quite sure, or, and they both had their arms switched so far at the back, they came out and said, no, 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 I'm, I'm wrong, I, I absolutely agree, yes. Yeah. Well, Bill, we gave his career up. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. David Attenborough went yeah. the other way. The, the other thing that's odd as well is, of course, uh, the Green Party absolutely hates Brexit. They keep telling us what economic damage it will do. Uh, and then they say, what we want to do is we want to have, uh, we want to be part of the European Union and then inflict our own policies to cause separate economic damage. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, the idea that leaving the European Union, they keep predicting there'll be a, a massive amount of uh, uh, a slowdown in the economy, we're all going to be, you know, tilling our own back gardens for turnips and things. Yeah. Uh, and, but they're saying, well, marvellous, this is exactly what we want. They say, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> It's, it's the, it seems to me like equality it is a scam for political action. There, it's a total non problem for political action. Equality. I keep reading articles all the time that say, if only we could, if only we could close the gender pay gap, how much we could boost the economy. Mm. The idea that any kind of productivity enters these people's heads, you know, just, okay. they simply think that mad legislative action will boost the economy. Mm. And then they say, but we don't want to boost the economy because we want to all live cheaper, poorer lives, <laughs> save us with climate change. It is lies and contradiction all the way through. And all it is, it's, I mean, I don't know anything at all about the science, but it's, it's so obvious to me that it's just an excuse for political activism mm, uh, and, and power, power trips and the denouncing people, which is, you know, a, a moral, uh, getting on your moral high horse and condemning people. This is what motivates people, this is what people love. It's an absolute excuse for a hobby horse of moral condemnation, <laughs> abuse, ostracizing people, exercising power, the whole political shebang, that's all it is. Yeah, that's that's how it seems to be. Actually, I was, <laughs> I, I was very surprised when the climate gate thing broke at the University of East Anglia. I thought, okay, now they have a problem. Now it's it's shown that the major graph behind the assumption that it is, is warming is, is a fraud, an outright fraud. And I'm amazed that they came back from it. And the reason why they came back from it is because no one cares about the science. Anyone, no one understood how much of a, of a problem this revelation was. No one understood that this whole theory is based on this hockey stick graph. And if that turns out to be a fraud, the whole theory has a huge problem. But in order to understand it, you need to know anything about the theory, which no one does. They just like the idea that the planet is warming because we're putting out CO2 because it, it justifies all kind of moral stuff and, and, and politics. So who cares about the science? Uh, to what extent do you think politicians actually use climate warming to excuse green taxes? Uh, well, we have seen, uh, I'm not sure how many green taxes there are in this country. In, in Germany, there are definitely many, and they're quite happy to have an excuse to tax people. There's actually, there's actually a massive industry around that carbon. Have you heard of carbon tax industry? That's huge. They don't have to destroy it. Yeah, I've already declared I've got a vested interest in this, actually. I actually went to the University of East Anglia. <laughs> you know? yeah. Did you? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think so, that's what done for you. <laughs> when I first came out with global warming. Um, what about the uh, other aspects of global warming, the things you never really touched on, for example, like the acidification of the oceans? Uh, that's even more worrying. Um, I, I think the, that that is uh, a so separate, uh, because, separate environmental issue. But because but, I mean, the, the woman it didn't really say the whole world's going to just warm. I mean, it, it's going to just it, it's saying it's going to get more extreme in different parts of the world, and it does seem like that's happening as it happens. Uh, I'm not an apologist for global warming, but there's other things more worrying than that. So, such, for example, such as the acidification of the oceans, they get a more acidic. Really I think I think that it's an older theory that hasn't really uh, materialized, uh, and it, I think it has something uh, to do with other emissions, not with CO two. Um, as far as extremes goes, I think there is some evidence that strong storms are getting a little bit stronger. Yes, um, but you know, then again, I think that the way to deal with it is build more robust houses, and uh, you need energy for that, and and. And get people out of poverty, and then it's not not too much of a problem. Whenever whenever a hurricane hits a third world country, uh, it's a huge problem because these people live in in very primitive housing and, and so on, and, and have no protection from it. Well, if it hits Florida, it's still a problem. People don't like it, but you know, it's it's it well, doesn't it doesn't cause huge amounts of death, and uh, the, the it's cleaned up completely because Florida has the money to do it. And that's that's the way you, you deal with it. You bring people out of poverty. 
And the way you bring people out of poverty is not by denying them access to cheap energy. That's exactly the wrong way to do it. Yeah. There is just another aspect to this very quickly. And it, when, when it reaches a level of acidification, when you get a, a certain level of acidification, apparently the, the oceans overlay a, a, a methane sink and, and, and the, the oceans. And it may be that it just requires a small tipping point for this methane sink to bubble up. You already see it with a permafrost, for example, in Russia, where you can actually light, uh, you know, bogs yeah. with methane coming up. And it's the same thing under the oceans. You, you've got these huge methane bits. Now, it might just be a small tipping, tipping point where these things start to bubble up. Yeah. And once you get methane in the, in the ocean, I mean, carbon dioxide is like, would be like a vicarage tea party. Well, I think the, the, the methane would, would go out of the ocean because it's, it's a gas. Um, but, um, yeah, methane is a, is a greenhouse gas and, um, uh, and I think uh, more, more extreme than CO2. So that's, that's the other scale why, it should, uh, why it's apparently um, exaggerating because if we get warming, then the permafrost will, uh, will melt and then um, uh, we, we get all this methane, which will then uh, lead to an acceleration of the warming and so on. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe it isn't. But as I as I explained in my, my talk, I mean, whatever happens to the climate, even if it does get warmer by quite a bit, I don't think it's it's more of a problem. I I think, as I said more than once, I think actually there's a good case for making the argument that right now it's uh, it's a bit too cold on the planet overall. And, you know, so I don't I don't see this as a problem. Not not, 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 not right now. Hmm? Not right now. Not right now. Okay, no, this is, this is quite nice. Do <laughs> you, you, you still want to talk? Still no, want to... but it's a little preposterous to say that it's a little too, you know, a little too cold is a bit much. I mean, that's a bit rich. It's a lot of the United States you know, has water problems when it doesn't snow enough. It doesn't snow enough when it's not cold enough. So it's a little rich to say it's, it's not warm enough. That's, I mean, come on. Uh, no, it's, it's, I, it's know, not. The United States sort of runs out of water but what to say that it doesn't snow enough. Well, to say that right now is the best temperature when uh, half of the planet is not inhabitable because it's too cold is, is kind of a, a yeah, adventurous you know, thesis. You also right? try and say that it's politically untenable for people, for politicians to say use less fossil fuels. That's one of the things you close it. You said That's politicians can't fuel. actually enforce that because it, people would rise up. They would be upset without, if they couldn't drive their car for cheap and buy plastic for cheap and all the things yeah. that fossil fuel, right? Uh, but if you say, if the same politician says you have to move inland because of sea level rise, they might have the same pushback. Oh, it's, but but they don't have to say this. Sort of the same, sea level same rise. Problem. The sea levels cannot rise very quickly. Even if all the all the ice of Greenland melts in one year, for that water to distribute all over the oceans and it actually causes the sea level so would take many decades. If it is a problem, it would be a slow problem. And very slow. And, and you know, in the, in the last century, and in, in the 20th century, sea levels has risen by about a foot. No one has, has noticed because it's too slow for us to notice these things. Actually, in the 10th century, the sea level was much higher. I mean, when the Normans landed Hastings, they actually landed about a mile inland. The sea levels were much higher. There's, there's, um, actually, the world, the planet was very warm. Actually, 11th century, sorry. So, I don't know about that. You know, yeah. I mean, so we've been through these periods before, and the thing is, things about the global warming lobby, they seem to be historically a bit sort of lax somehow. Mm. And in the 1950s, there was huge, there was huge um, um, storms in East Anglia, which 200 people died. I mean, nowadays they'd be saying this is a global warming event. But this was way before anyone thought about global warming. And no, I mean, we have always. I, I am absolutely aware that the climate, as I said in my talk, has always been a problem for for humans. If the the climate can be very extreme, and uh, and it has always killed lots of people. Uh, before we started using fossil fuels, it it, was, it killed millions of people every year. Now we are down to a few thousand a year because we can now deal better with the consequences. And, uh, and I'm not saying that climate is not a problem, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that the solution is not to try to control it, because that seems no, agree, preposterous. Agree. The solution is clearly to find good ways to, uh, to, uh, to deal with... To, if there's a heat wave, we need air conditioning, like in here, and then the temperature is fine, you know? 
But it's Actually, quite, like it's quite convenient for the climate change lobby that the historical records go back so such a short period of time that yeah. um, they always claim this is a new a new level of um, temperature change. Oh, and, oh but they can also see even even these so-called really hot temperatures nowadays they've been superseded before by temperatures in the nineteen twenties and thirties, which are much hotter. Yeah, no, uh, but. Politicians can always rely that people have a very short memory because usually people don't look into history books. They 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 remember what what happened in their life and maybe just in their recent lives. Really, uh, I think people in this summer uh, talked about that seventy six was a very hot summer and that reminded them of that. And that's about as far history as, as you can get. Other than that, it's, you know, if it's not on video and they haven't experienced it. It's a very theoretical argument, which doesn't count for most people. And this is, I, I completely agree uh, with, with with Paul there. I think it's, it's mostly a political scam. And, and so why would you why would you bother looking into into history? Because that defeats the whole purpose. The purpose is not about climate. It's about having a nice theory that justifies all kinds of politics. Anyone else? Got something to say? Oh, that's well, another yeah. thing. I think climate change is attacking the poor, really. Oh, it's yeah. Just, it's the poor that pays for this. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm well, that, that's true. Just, that's true. Yeah. 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 No, that's I mean, all these, all these, all these uh, initiatives. I mean, we're paying much more for electricity than we should should pay, and you know. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in Germany, there is uh, where I'm from. They have uh, introduced lots of wind and solar and, and so on, which is just crazy. And it has it has doubled electricity price. You now have a saying in, in Germany, which is ever energy poverty. They are now the poorest part of, of, of the society have big trouble paying their electricity. You're conflating bills. pollution with climate change. The talk was on climate change. Some fossil fuels create pollution that's separate to warming. Or, or other things. No, but pollution in air quality is different. But and how you generate. But, but that's not why they did it. They did it to yeah, to reduce CO two. No, some of the reason they did it is. I mean, London was unbreathable at certain points in its history. Oh yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 absolutely. No, no, I'm not. I'm not against. It's actually pretty crappy but, but, even but, now. No, but but versus a lot of other places. But the point is, CO two is not the problem. Other stuff in fossil fuel problems is a problem, but, but and we have solved that problem again with engineering. I mean, they have they have measured cars now where the air coming out of the exhaust was was uh, was cleaner than the surrounding <laughs> air because the filtering was so good. I'm just saying that, that you know, conflating uh, global warming with with pollution, they're, they're two different things, and. They are two different things, but the reason why Germany has solar in, in this stuff is not because of pollution, because it is because of, of global warming. Two different things. That may be, may be but, that is so. but uh, in electricity the generation does anyway. come huh? with pollution. It can't be two different things, because glo global warming is a manic state of sort of pollution. Well, but a different form. Global warming centers yeah. around CO2, which by any normal measure is not a pollutant. It's actually the elixir of life. I mean, it's what we need. Have greener forests. Huh? Are exactly. Yeah. yeah, I agree. The global warming and pollution are two different things. I mean, for yeah. example, the, the old conversation. Old, I mean, yeah. not that's CFCs and so forth. Some of the yeah. reason for generating fuel a certain way. And, and I will say because of pollution. And I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm very skeptical about the environmental movement in general. But of course, I mean, reducing pollution, if you have a problem breathing the outside, I think in the 50s there was, a, there was two days in, in, in some winter where a few thousand people died because they couldn't breathe the air and everyone was hitting. Now that's a problem. And what's happening in China right now that you can't breathe the air, and that's a problem. These are environmental problems that I, I, I can, I can uh, see should be solved. As, as a libertarian and as a humanist, and because my perspective is really human flourishing. And if something is preventing humans from flourishing, then I agree it's a problem. But the, the whole environmentalist movement these days is not very humanistic. They are literally environmentalists. They believe the environment needs to be protected from interference, even if that means that humans are worse off. And that's a crazy, uh, crazy ideology, in, in my view. Yes, but um, just to sum up what our friend raised here about the, the, the poor paying for this, what you, you, you mentioned there. Well, Actually, uh, what, what Donald Trump would say, for example, <laughs> about why he pulled out one of the reasons why he pulled out the solar. Ever, 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 ever in your life. Agreement. <laughs> is he, not say he, that he, he would say, well, you've got, I mean, the third world countries, you see, they're exempted from all these 
uh, you know, laws and regulations. And he would say, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the uh, first or second world countries which have to pay for this, and the third world get away. And he'd get away with these restrictions, which he doesn't like. He says they're not fair. They're not fair in the United States, for example. And I'm just pointing out that he would say, uh, no, the poor aren't paying for it in a way. Uh, in fact, he would call it, I mean, controversially, but I've heard this said before, incidentally, he would actually label it the white man's bird. Mm. But, uh, you, you might yeah. that I, I don't think I get into trying to interpret what goes on in Trump's head. That, that would be too too much now. Yeah. But I think we have to we have to yeah, finish so, now because. Yeah, so, uh, well, we'll finish the few, so, well. But yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.